So she, so she was my professor back in grad school. Um, and it was actually a really small class, only five of us, the mathematics of economics. And I didn't realize this at the time, but she was one of the key authors of the Kyoto Protocol. And she was also a author on a, um, on a paper that won the Nobel Prize. Uh, so when I asked her to speak here, um, I emailed her and she replied within an hour. And I was super excited that we were going to have a, 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 the Kyoto Protocol offer and one of the authors of a Nobel Prize winning paper here. She also sent us her fun fact, which is actually something I didn't know about her at the time either. I knew half of it, but not both of it. Um, she never went to college. But then she got a PhD in math. And then she got a second PhD in economics. And I have friends who have two PhDs and I have friends who have a PhD without going to college. This is the first time I've seen an intersection of no college and two PhDs. So I figure I'm having no college, two PhDs and being on a Nobel Prize winning paper, we can give a, uh, we can give a uh, video talk here. Thank you very much for being here today. And particularly thank you, of course, for the heroes of the medical profession that are taking care of everybody. And uh, in this uh, horrific pandemic situation that we're going through. I want to thank to all of you, not just for being here, but also for being part of the solution and not part of the problem. My name is Graciela Cicciniski and I am the co-founder and the CEO of Global Thermostat. That's a company that started in 2010, and we have a technology that can remove CO2 from the atmosphere and transform it into biofertilizers in foods and beverages, building materials, synthetic fuels, seawater desalination, and enhanced oil recovery. In fact, Direct air capture, which is changing the way energy is produced the world over. And we're doing this with extraordinary partners that include the Coca-Cola company, ExxonMobil, um, Air Liquid, include Aqua, the biggest desalination firm in the world, and Saudi Aramco. And more recently, AME and Siemens, the large engineering firm, for the production of synthetic fuels that essentially are like gasoline without producing emissions. In the year 2019, Global Thermostat was chosen among top 10 breakthrough technologies in the world by MIT Technology Review curated by Bill Gates. So direct air capture and global thermostat technology removes CO2 from the atmosphere and it stabilizes it. It embodies it into projects that stabilize CO2 on Earth. So at the end of the process, you end up with less CO2 in the atmosphere and more on Earth. And it's accepted by National Academy of Sciences and the IPCC that direct air capture can indeed remove CO2, is feasible technologically, can remove it from the atmosphere as is needed now, according to the United Nations. It's not sufficient to limit it anymore. It has to be removed. But it can do so at low enough cost that when you sell it, to what McKinsey says is projected to be a trillion dollar market, you make money out of this. So you improve the economy, you create jobs, and you clean the atmosphere all at once. That is the purpose of global thermostat. Um, first, let me tell you where this is originated. This whole thing started 20 years ago, actually 23, when the nations of the world, 160 of them, voted for the Kyoto Protocol, and the US was one of the voters. And the Kyoto Protocol was a way to prevent catastrophic climate change. In 1997, I wrote into the Kyoto Protocol, I designed and wrote 
the carbon market of the Kyoto Protocol that works by putting limits on emissions and allowing those that go above the limit to compensate those that are below the limit. Just before this horrific pandemic started in December of 2019, Physics Today published an article about the fact that the carbon market is considered to be by economists in terms of the price of carbon as the necessary solution to climate change. And in fact, that carbon market that we created then, the first one in the world, the European Union Emission Trading System, succeeded in its purpose so that as of now, 23 years later, and become, after becoming international law in 2005, it has decreased the emissions of 50 nations in the European Union. Um, those emissions are now 20% lower as they were when we started in 2005. That means the carbon market succeeded, but it means more. It means that that amount, that decrease in emissions of these 50 nations of the European Union, if extended to all the countries that signed the protocol then, particularly the United States, uh, would have resolved climate change. That's what it means. So it means that we already had a solution over 20 years ago. It was not implemented, and I want to talk about why, fully, but it was sufficiently implemented that 25% of humankind is now governed by carbon markets, which are the descendants of the carbon market that I wrote in the Kyoto Protocol in 1997 and became international law in 2005. If, if we had decreased the entire emissions of the world by 20% below the level of the 2005 emissions, the situation now will be essentially resolved and we would not have to go forward. But instead of that, uh, there was a lot of concern about the impact that limiting emissions would have on the economy. Those concerns were particularly in the United States because the US was the largest emitter of CO2 at that point. And because of that, a law emerged in the United States, the Bird Seagull Law, which passed in 1997 unanimously in the Congress, saying that the United States would not accept any limitations on emissions that hurt the global economy or that hurt actually the US economy. And that Bird Seagull law, in fact, detained progress because there was the fear that limiting emissions as required by the Kyoto Protocol will have such a negative effect in the US economy. So the US signed the Kyoto Protocol, but didn't ratify it and it didn't execute it. And the US was the largest emitter. The European Union, 50 nations did and they solved the problem, but we needed the problem to be more general. Now we have carbon markets in China, carbon markets in California, carbon markets in several states of the Eastern USA, and of course, carbon markets in the European Union. But there was that fear that it may hurt the economy. So I was then the lead author of the IPCC representing the US, and I knew that if we didn't take action then, something different would have to be done. And as part of that plan, I created Global Thermostat to agree on the solution that was requested, if you wish, by the Bird Seagull Act, to show that decreasing emissions does not hurt the economy, it can be helpful to the economy. And indeed, 
that's what that's the purpose of global thermostat is to resolve the problem of climate change in a way that is commercially feasible through the production of all those services and goods with our partners and clients that I mentioned before. It is actually a global transformation because now there is a technological solution. That technological solution has two levels. At one level, the company Global Thermostat created a breakthrough technology that removes CO2 directly from the atmosphere and it can do so in such a way that the carbon that is removed is commercially valuable and is used for those purposes. That technology, which is all, it also goes by the name of direct air capture, directly cleans the atmosphere, directly captures the CO2. And our firm can do so at sufficiently low cost that when you sell it, you make profits, you create economic development, and you create very good jobs. The second technological aspect that is uh, very important is that out of the Kyoto Protocol, hundreds of billions of dollars traded were used to be and sent to developing nations, including China, particularly China, for clean technology projects. And China used their allocation for the scaling up of photovoltaic technology. And that means that right now, thanks to the Chinese effort and to the funding for that effort that was created by the carbon market um, in 2005, when it became law, we now can be sure that the per kilowatt hour electricity produced by solar energy is lower cost than the electricity that is produced by coal. And this is important because everybody agrees that right now, the world economy in the next 20 years is going to double its consumption of energy. So the solution here has two technological parts. One is a solar revolution, the photovoltaic revolution, where you can produce solar energy much cheaper than you can do, produ uh, than you can produce it by using coal and fossil fuels. The second part, global thermostat technology that can remove CO2 directly from the atmosphere. So the initial solution that succeeded because it took down by 20% the emissions of CO2 from the original level as of now, amazing. That solution was only partial because only the European Union adopted it so far, but the, I mean, that solution now was prevented globally by the vision that limiting emissions would hurt the economy. And now the new technology shows the opposite. It can be done in a commercially feasible way. It can be done while making money, while growing the economy and growing jobs. So that's, in a way, the second time that we resolve climate change. The first time it was with the carbon market that all economists agree a price of carbon is needed to resolve climate change. And that was the price of carbon and it could do it. The second time is to show, and you can go through that solution in a way that helps the economy, in a way that produces jobs, in a way that leads to clean development, the clean materials, clean energy, helped by the fact that the funding from the Kyoto Protocol, the billions, the hundreds of billions that went to developing countries was used to scale up the photovoltaic, photovoltaic technology, leading to very inexpensive solar energy today that undercuts fossil fuels in the production of electricity. This is a uh, successful story, but it's not finished. 
we know what we have to do. We are doing it. And we have fantastic, extraordinary, I should say, technology partners and clients that I already mentioned in that process. This is, we know we have to do that, but I wanted to say finally that even the Pope, as well as many other thinkers and other religious leaders perceive that the oil and gas industry plays an important role here. And the proposal here is to work with our technology partners, with um, two folk heroes. First, the creator of EarthX, why we are here today, Trammell Crow. Thank you so much. He has a vision of a consortium of oil and gas companies, perhaps sitting here in Texas, that can achieve the transformation, perhaps using our technology, but it can be done and they can become part of the solution. Very important. That is supported by uh, experts, by our company for sure, and our partners and clients, but also by experts like Ted Roosevelt at Barclays Bank. All of us have the same vision. We think that the oil and gas company can transform itself to part of the solution. We did it once over 20 plus years ago, and we can do it again. We're going to reverse climate change and overcome catastrophic um, problem that is facing humankind. We need to do it. There is no other choice, because if we don't do it, we won't be here to tell the story. So let's do it for the second time. Thank you. All right, everybody. I uh, hope you enjoyed that talk. Uh, it was very fascinating to hear about the carbon markets and the effect it had and the, the ongoing effect of the photovoltaic market. Um, so I hope everyone enjoyed that talk, got a lot out of that. I wish uh, Dr. Chinsolnitsky could have been here, uh, but hopefully that video uh, gave you all the information she wanted, wanted to present to you. Um, so I, I enjoyed that, but also I'm a bit biased. Uh, so, all right. So thank you, uh, Graciela. And now we have...